This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hello everyone, and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn, I'm standing in for Siobhan O'Sullivan. Siobhan and I both like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA, that's A-A-S-A. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Have you joined ASA yet? You can join for 60 Australian dollars if you're a waged academic and only 15 Australian dollars if you're unwaged, including students and those who are precariously waged. ASA is such an important resource for animal studies scholars. For example, did you know that you can watch keynote presentations from their conferences going back to 2013? If you want to watch those, go to animalstudies.org.au forward slash conferences. And lots of the speakers there will be familiar to regular listeners of Knowing Animals. This episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public's book series. This is a series from Sydney University Press focused on animal studies. At the time of this podcast release, a new book will have just been published as part of the series. It's called Dingo Bold, The Life and Death of Kagari Dingoes, and it's by Rowena Lennox. It was released on the 1st of January. Dingo Bold draws upon ecology, social science and literature to ask what we know about the history of human-dingo relationships. And I know that topic is going to be of great interest to lots of listeners. So why don't you take a look at the Animal Public's website to find out a bit more. This week, we are joined by Ian Werkheiser. Ian is an Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and is the Director of the Centre for Collaboration and Ethics at the University. We're going to be talking about Ian's paper, Precision Livestock Farming and Farmers' Duties to Livestock, which was published in the Journal of Agricultural and Environmental Ethics. And listeners might be quite interested to know that this paper was part of a special issue on engineering and animal ethics, which was co-edited by Claire Palmer and Gary Varner. Welcome to the podcast, Ian. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So to start off, can you tell us what inspired you to work on this topic? Um, Yeah, so partly uh, my research background, uh, I come, my PhD is from Michigan State University, which uh, is an agricultural land grant school, one of the oldest, in fact, the oldest land grant school in the United States. And unlike a lot of universities, at least in the US, uh, there's a lot of good relationships between the philosophy department there and some of the agricultural work that's being done at the university. So like the Kellogg Biological Research Station, uh, which researches uh, new farming techniques and ways that Uh, Farmers can have less environmental impact on the land, all sorts of farmers. Um, I did projects with them while I was a PhD student. So I have a a lot of background in thinking about that kind of um, uh, implications of research, uh, philosophical research for farmers. And then also, um, I do a lot of work in philosophy of technology, thinking about the ways that that new technologies either include or disinclude certain kinds of voices, including non-human voices. Great. So this is a paper about precision livestock farming. And I know that's a term that's sometimes used, sometimes other terms are used for that. But could you introduce us to this idea of precision livestock farming? Sure. Yeah. So lots of other terms are used too. But I think that in the slow war for who gets to name something, that one is slowly pulling ahead. Um, And it just refers to a suite of technologies, some of them already extant and most of them probably just sort of speculative at this point, that uh, allow for more monitoring and uh, more automatic uh, fine-tuning of the inputs that you give toward non-human animals in farms. Uh, The promise of it, like the idea of precision livestock farming, is basically to, uh, you know, according to boosters of the program, is to replicate at scale the individual attention that one a uh, stock person has towards an animal. So if you imagine sort of the bucolic, maybe never truly existed, but certainly doesn't really exist now, ideal of a farmer with like three cows that, you know, he's named all three of them. Um, he talks to them while he milks them. He knows that this one has, you know, favors her left side. That one doesn't like clover, those sorts of things. Um, of course, that kind of knowledge and interaction and hopefully 
uh, welfare-based care, but certainly, uh, you know, the things that farmers are interested in, like efficiency and keeping the animals healthy, is difficult to essentially impossible to replicate at larger scales. And uh, the promise of this technology is that by using big data, using learning algorithms, learning using automatically generated, um, you know, connections between inputs and outputs, so that you know, for example, if a cow uh, makes a particular noise or moves somewhere or leans somewhere that computers can use that to predict its behavior and what it needs. Does it need more food or more water? And that that way it's the animal is still getting that kind of careful, fine tuned, individualized care, uh, that a farmer would give, but because of computing advancements and processing advancements, you could do that for thousands of animals at the same time. I mean, the ones that people have been focusing on quite a bit are pigs and chickens. And so the idea is that, you know, you can monitor everything for, for a pig, everything from temperature to noises they're making to studying their odors or the odors of their feces to, um, you know, heart rate and uh, skin conductivity, you know, a million sort of factors like that and use that to make sure that you are uh, for example, giving them enough food. So food is a big issue for farmers with uh, who have lots of pigs because, um, you know, the question is how much should you feed your pigs? Every pig requires sort of a different amount of food, rather like humans. And you can't make a decision as a farmer to give each pig a different amount if you have a thousand pigs. So instead, you would feed usually the amount of food about the amount of food that the one who needs the most requires. Um, because you want to put on as much weight as possible onto those pigs so that you get as much money as possible when it comes time to slaughter and kill them and sell their meat, right? So uh, the issue with that, of course, is that you're wasting a lot of money by buying food. You are causing illness and ill health in the pigs that are overeating. Um, you're causing huge environmental impact from increased uh, waste, both pig feces and also just wasted food. Um, so all of these problems are bad. Wouldn't it be better if we could feed each pig exactly as much as they need. That's the, that's the claim. So it's sort of a, it benefits everyone all at once. It benefits the pigs in terms of their welfare. It benefits uh, the environment in terms of environmental impact. It benefits farmers in terms of them being able to maximize profits and scale efficiently, but also it benefits farmers in the, uh, and a lot of the, liter basically all of the literature on PLF uh, stresses this point. It benefits farmers because it allows them to do what they want to do, which is care for animals which, you know, we can talk about uh, the extent to which that's accurate, but uh, that they want to care for animals and this will allow them to do that. So they are reluctantly growing in order to sort of stay alive, but this will allow them to keep the parts of being a farmer that they like. And, you know, it's very techno-utopian. A lot of uh, the literature on this actually says that it'll be better than individual farmer care. So like you can imagine computer algorithms can find very uh, complicated causal networks, just like, you know, the uh, Amazon algorithm that recommends what you might want to purchase given things you've already purchased might uh, be better at guessing that than some friend of yours who buys you a birthday present. Likewise, the algorithms from PLF might be able to notice things about cows and pigs behavior that farmers don't notice. Um, maybe sub vocal sounds that a sensitive microphone could pick up, but a farmer won't. Uh, that might indicate distress, for example. So the idea is that it'll be even better for pigs than the small farms are, even more attention. And farmers will have everything you know, at their fingertips. There's lots of graphics of people having it all on their phone. Great. So that's the kind of the hope and promise right. of the, the engineers creating this. And perhaps, dare I say, the sort of thing that the farmers adopting this are hoping for. So from your perspective as an ethicist and also an ethicist who is prepared to take animals quite seriously, um, do you think it's going to live up to this promise? Yeah, uh, I mean, not really would be <laughs> the short answer. Uh, so we're done with the podcast, but uh, <laughs> let, let me go into some more details. Um, so uh, I, I see a lot of cause for concern you know, with any sort of techno-utopian kind of language for technology in general, but particularly when it's focused around non-human animals um, by people who aren't taking them seriously as beings, right, but rather as, you know, sort of a, an, a factor in their equations that they're trying to, you know, uh, solve for maximum efficiency. Um, and I, I will say before I sort of get into those, though, that actually a lot of farmers have not been adopting this technology, which is something that engineers are concerned about. Um, and so part of my paper goes into why I think that might be. But um, so 
when it comes to ethical concerns, some of them are just the sorts of ethical concerns that you would have for any new technology. So it's not particularly PLF specific. Uh, for example, whenever you have a new suite of technology that's coming out in an industry, you can imagine that that will lead to further concentration um, because if it works and is helpful, then companies that can, you know, or in this case, farms that can best afford that new technology will be early adopters. They'll get benefits uh, quicker than other people who can't and are using older technology, and they can use that to expand uh, their farms, purchase other farms. I mean, there's so much, you know, razor thin profit margins for a lot of these operations that if somebody can get a leg up on somebody else that quickly magnifies into one of them losing their business altogether. That's why the sort of, uh, at least as we say in America, the go big or go home approach to animal husbandry has taken off since the 1970s uh, or one of the reasons. And so that's a concern because, uh, I mean, first of all, it's a concern if you think that it's that farming is a desired outcome, that being a farmer or having farms in a country is a desired outcome. And PLF uh, proponents definitely do, right? They, particularly in the European Union, uh, use PLF as a promise for being able to preserve farms profitably in Europe um, rather than having to move almost exclusively to importing it from you know, Africa and other places. So uh, if they see it as a good, it's actually likely to reduce the number of farms. Um, and also, if you're concerned with high volume CAFOs, uh, battery cage chicken farms, you know, those sorts of large scale animal uh, operations, then you should also be concerned ethically because you're going to see an increase of that because you can do it more efficiently. So that's one sort of concern, uh, you know, sort of like technological treadmill. Um, another problem uh, that's a little more PLF specific is that you're only going to be taking in inputs from these animals that uh, engineers are looking for. And of course, uh, some of these technologies aren't being done with any input at all from farmers. Uh, so they're likely to miss things that uh, people who do daily care for animals uh, might be looking for. But also, as I argue in the paper, um, and this isn't just me, I, as I reference other research in the paper, uh, it's quite common for people who spend time with animals when asked, uh, particularly by, you know, the white lab coat types, you know, in a formal situation to minimize the signs that they look for in other animals, like to minimize the amount of communication they have with non-human animals. And so, um, you know, that, for example, the, the example I use in the paper is that farmers are unlikely to tell engineers that you can, that this cow looks sad because it doesn't seem particularly quantifiable and doesn't seem you know, manly or, you know, there's a lot of problems with it, but uh, it's quite likely that humans are able to pick up on micro expressions uh, from small facial muscles or from body posture from non-human animals too. I mean, we can all tell when our pets are sad, for example, uh, or I, I would like to say that most of us can tell when our pets are sad. So, uh, so those are unlikely to be baked into these sorts of algorithms. And so we'll only be measuring particular things when, when you get more efficient and effective at optimizing for certain qualities then you run a risk of damaging or harming qualities that aren't being tracked. And so as you bake into PLF particular things you're looking for, and presumably these will be capitalist-driven, monetarily-driven sorts of things like size and weight and you know various aspects of the meat uh, or the eggs or whatever it is that you're, or the milk, whatever it is you're looking for, um, that you're going to be doing other sorts of harms. Um, another thing, of course, is that like if you think about welfare, the concept of what animal welfare is for uh, livestock that are being raised is quite complex and often uh, in tension with one another, the different conceptions of it. So for example, animal welfare might mean that the animal is healthy in sort of like a veterinary medical kind of sense. And PLF would probably be pretty good at maximizing that, in fact. Another way that animals have welfare is being able to pursue sort of their their telos, right? So for a chicken to be able to do chickeny kinds of things, their species-specific behavior, uh, pigs to be able to do pig sort of things, etc. cetera. Um, now, the thing is, those often come apart from each other. It's often the case that it would be healthier in some sense of, uh, you know, what a vet might measure in terms of stress, for example, for animals to be isolated from one another, um, because it's easy to measure stress in an animal. It's not so easy to measure depression or loneliness or anxiety. Uh, but you know, for social animals like pigs and chickens and cows, uh, it's the case that to do their sort of species specific behavior, they do want uh, to be with a, a small number, a limited number 
of conspecifics. Uh, also, there's a sense of welfare as in their psychological health. Uh, also, there's a sense of welfare in terms of their autonomy. So their ability to make their own choices and pursue their own interests. So if they want to go stand over there, if they want to rut over here, if they want to, you know, their, their own sorts of plans throughout the day, um, which is quite minimized in the literature as a kind of welfare, but I think is real. And it's likely that PLF technologies will not do a good job of maximizing species spe specific behavior, autonomous behavior, and those sorts of concepts of welfare. So you're maximizing for some while possibly harming others. Um, and then there's another sense, and this connects to why I think farmers haven't adopted it. Um, engineers think that, I mean, most of the literature among engineers is that farmers haven't adopted it because either the engineers have done a d bad job of reaching out so they need to be more slick. So maybe we'll stop calling it PLF because that's a very engineering term. We'll call it like smart farming because that's something that might appeal to farmers, that sort of thing. Um, or they'll say, well, farmers are backwards and you have to drag them along or beat them with a stick to move forward. They're not going to uh, you know, willingly experiment with things. So either they're being backward or we need to advertise better. But uh, I argue in this paper and I've argued elsewhere that it actually might just be that farmers hear the argument that this will allow them to um, be better stewards of their animals and don't accept it, um, that they it doesn't seem plausible to them. Um, now, I haven't interviewed farmers on this. I probably should in future work. I've, I've done some work with farmers on sustainability where I similarly asked them uh, if they just sort of accepted the concepts of sustainability that were being put forward by new farming technologies, and it turned out that they didn't. Um, so I have some reason to suspect that they might just be rejecting some of this framing also, but uh, they would have reason to reject this because I also don't think that this satisfies a lot of farmers' responsibilities to animals. So, you know, if we bracket for a moment, uh, you know, the idea of slaughtering animals at the end of their lives, or I mean, when you choose <laughs> for it to be the end of their lives, um, then up until that point, farmers, I think, still do have uh, responsibilities to the animals under their care. And obviously, the law agrees with me, and most farmers would agree with me. Um, and if that's the case, I don't think it can be discharged fully by turning it over to uh, some complicated AI and you know, there and then allowing it to be in this sort of very small space, you know, a limited kind of cage. Um, you know, coming back to the conspecific behavior, uh, something I should have mentioned is that for PLF to work very well, you need to have lots of sensors. And if you're going to have lots of sensors, you know, pointing at this animal, the animal isn't running free in a field, right? It's in a sort of controlled white room. Um, so, you know, the analogy I use in the paper is if you think about uh, our responsibility to dependent humans that we might have, whether it's elderly humans uh, under our care or children under our care, um, you know, I have to be a little bit careful about this because uh, some people don't like strong analogies between our relationship with non-humans and our relationship with our own children. But uh, I think that some aspects of the analogy are true. And one of them is that we have definite responsibilities to humans under our care. And most of us would think intuitively, I bet, I mean, send me an email if you don't, uh, that we can't just discharge those responsibilities by turning it over to AI and algorithms, right? That we that it's, it isn't sufficient for us to say, well, YouTube Kids has a pretty good algorithm for making sure that children are seeing age appropriate behavior, uh, age appropriate videos that they're that are learning and good for them and help cognitive development. So I plop them down in front of YouTube uh, Kids and I hit play and I say, you know, just watch anything that's on here and I walk away. We wouldn't think that that's true. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't think that if every aspect of their care from food to uh, when they go to sleep, to the temperature, to uh, how much light they have shining on them, to, you know, all the sorts of things we control for non-human animals um, was also controlled by similar uh, Google algorithms. We would think that probably the parent has to be involved, that there's some uh, aspect of your responsibility that can only be discharged through personal care or by choosing a proxy. So, uh, you know, having a babysitter doesn't seem like a huge abrogation of your responsibilities, but, uh, you know, leaving some sort of odd robot to follow them around the room, like a very complicated Zoom, a very complicated uh, Roomba does sort of feel like more of an, uh, an abrogation of our responsibilities. Um, and so if that's right, then the, it, and if it's the case that our ideal for farming, assuming we have an ideal for livestock farming is 
personal responsibility, personal knowledge of the animals by a farmer, uh, then it's true that we lose that responsibility when we scale up, but we don't regain it by turning things over to closed loop engineering systems. Thanks. So a lot of this sounds very welfareist Mm -hmm. in the sense of it's taking for granted that forms of animal farming are acceptable. So I suppose there are going to be a lot of animal ethicists, animal studies scholars, especially, say, those who advocate for animal rights or those who are in the kind of critical animal studies wing of animal studies, who Mm -hmm. would say something like, look, this is all just fiddling at the edges. This question about whether um, precision livestock farming increases this part of welfare or decreases that part of welfare, what we should be doing is we should be talking about stopping this farming altogether. And it strikes me that your paper, at the very end, for example, for both concerns for farmers and indeed concerns for animals, you seem to come again, come down against large-scale farming in all its forms, not just uh, precision livestock farming, but any kind of large-scale animal agriculture. Um, so I suppose my question is, first of all, do you think that's a fair representation of the sort of position you reach? And second of all, do you think that there's a worry in engaging in these kind of welfare conversations when what maybe we should be doing is engaging in something, engaging in critique that's a little bit more fundamental? Yeah. So I do want to be sensitive to that. There are certainly, so there there are people who think that it's always okay to have a welfare conversation uh, in an unjust system, right? So take a, like a very short term and strict utilitarian view that, uh, All we want to do is uh, improve the lot of beings that are suffering. Uh, We want to help them. And if at the end of this work you've advocated for, or you've convinced people to improve their lot, then great. And it doesn't matter that it exists in an unjust system. There are other people, I think, who would uh, never grant that that's okay, right? That it's never okay to talk about welfare in an unjust system. You're missing the forest for the trees. You're missing the important point that this entire system is bad, right? The whole court is out of order. Um, and I, you know, I, I understand both of those uh, responses. For me, I think that it's sometimes okay to talk about welfare in an unjust situation. Um, I think it's not a good idea to talk about welfare or to pursue welfare goals in an unjust situation if doing so uh, provides a veneer of justification for that unjust institution, if it reifies or solidifies or makes uh, it more sustainable. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I think it's probably neutral. It's probably okay if you want to have conversations about welfare if it's not affecting uh, the long-term viability of that institution or giving it justification. And I think it's genuinely good to discuss welfare issues if those welfare conversations undermine um, that unjust institution. So to give you an example, uh, other than my paper, just to sort of show you my thinking, In 2008, uh, Proposition 2 was on the ballot in California in the United States, which I advocated for and was an activist on behalf of. And what Proposition 2 argued is that for any confined animal in a livestock operation, uh, that confinement should be large enough that they can stand up, sit down, and turn around, as the slogan went. Now, obviously, uh, that's an improvement on their welfare, uh, being able to turn around Uh, ever in their lives, being able to stand up fully or sit down fully instead of spending their whole short lives crouched um, is a huge improvement to an individual animal's welfare. On the other hand, it's also clearly nowhere near sufficient. Being in a cage that is large enough for them to do those three things isn't what it is to have a good life if you're a chicken or a pig. However, the advocates for this uh, proposition, or at least many of them like me, made the second point. So it's good for the animals, but also it's a huge attack on high capacity feeding operations on battery cage farms, because those, as I was saying earlier, already have razor thin profit margins and you're making it less profitable for them. You're saying that the number of chickens you can have in a cubic foot uh, has gone down because you need to have larger cages for each animal. And if that's the case, a, n- a large number of the chicken operations in California, or at least the large scale ones, uh, would go out of business. Um, if that's true, then that does a few things. It 
increases the cost of eggs and chicken meat in California. Um, it uh, makes probably the total number of chickens that are being confined go down. And California often sees itself as sort of a bellwether for the rest of the United States, both for good and bad. Um, you know, it elected Ronald Reagan before he became president. But on the other hand, it's gotten a lot of progressive um, bills passed that then became uh, more common in the rest of the country. And if the rest of the United States did that, uh, it would have a, a large impact on chicken industry and the pig industry. In addition to sort of, you know, immediate welfare benefits like making gestation crates uh, for pigs impossible. So, uh, so I think that my paper and the work I've been doing on PLF is sort of in has a foot in the two camps of being sort of a neutral observation that just imminently your point, the argument that you're making in favor of PLF um, raised doesn't work. It has a lot of, by your own lights, of the things that you say you're caring about, environmental protection, uh, protecting farmers' jobs. I mean, I didn't get into that here, but I don't think it will do that. Um, and also uh, protecting farmers' roles as farmers and protecting animal welfare, um, that it fails on those grounds that you've set out. I think that's, you know, that's a fairly neutral observation. You can do that. But also, um, recall, as I was saying earlier, that this is being trumpeted as a way to preserve uh, farming. And when they say farming, what they mean is high capacity farming, right? Battery cages for hens, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of livestock, uh, and making that economically viable in Europe, uh, in the United States, uh, while still being sort of in line with uh, the animal welfare laws that are in both of those countries. Uh, so it makes it a financially possible thing, maybe even a maybe even a more profitable thing. So more people can get into it. We can make capacity lots even larger uh, without risking death of animals, which you know farmers also don't want the animals to die prematurely. That hurts their bottom line. Um, and so we, but we'll be able to expand because we'll have better uh, monitoring for these animals. And so to say that this technology, uh, in many cases, ought not to be adopted. I mean, I do sort of hedge my bets and say probably some of the PLF technologies would be fairly neutral and might be okay for animals, but the large, a large number of them would actually have quite negative effects, um, helps to undercut a thing that is trying to be put forward as a way to preserve and expand what I think most critical animal theorists would call an unjust institution of, you know, raising animals for slaughter. And so, uh, yeah, I think that my work hopefully, um, can be just sort of, uh, a fairly neutral, to acceptable conversation. I mean, like I'm, I'll talk about this more later, but I'm uh, going to be presenting some of this work to um, policy organizations, to some farming organizations um, in the EU moving forward and in England also actually. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's an imminent critique. I'm pointing out that they're having problems, so they're willing to listen and maybe it can have an effect, but also I think it has this sort of undermining, um, undercutting attack, right? That if, you know, they say, well, sure, they have to die and that's so sad, but we're treating them very well in the meantime. If you can point out, no, you aren't treating them very well in the meantime, I think that that can be a valuable observation. That's really fascinating. Thanks. I'm glad I asked that question because you've introduced a really interesting, useful distinction between different kinds of welfare approaches. Now, it'll be interesting to see if listeners agree with that distinction. Sure. No doubt there's going to be some people who are very critical of welfare style approaches all in, as you say. But yeah, there might be a middle ground with people who are dubious about welfare approaches, but perhaps open to them when framed in the right way. So, Ian, every guest, we ask five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I'll do my best. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Sure. Well, it depends what you mean by scholarship. So I, I have two answers, the, uh, anticipating two possible definitions you might have. The first is I read a PETA magazine when I was nine years old. And I currently have some issues with PETA. Uh, but <laughs> when, when I was nine, uh, it had a profound effect on me. I looked at images of uh, the way that animals are slaughtered, the way that chickens uh, in particular are slaughtered. And I closed the magazine and I said, I see. And I told my mom, I'm not eating animals anymore, uh, <laughs> which was you know, a fun shock for her when she picked me up from my babysitter's house where my babysitter had left that lying around. Uh, so, you know, and that sent me on a whole trajectory for my life, which I'm still pursuing now. So that had a huge effect on me. Uh, 
but in terms of like academic scholarship, the first book uh, or anything that I read in that vein was when I was an undergraduate, I read The Sexual Politics of Meat um, by Carol Adams and, or Carol J. Adams. And uh, that book also was very influential on me because it showed me, oh, you can do the kind of thinking I like to do, right? I, philosophical thinking. So at the time, I loved taking philosophy classes as an undergraduate. I really liked that particular way of looking at problems, but it seemed, uh, frankly, like solving crossword puzzles for money, right? It's amazing that somebody would pay you to do that. That sounds fun, but it also doesn't sound like it's like it, it matters. And that was one of the first things I looked at um, where I saw that you could do the kind of thinking that I like to do, um, you know, very conceptual thinking, of, you know, looking at different kinds of arguments, um, looking at things from a new perspective, but about something that I, that, you know, touched my heart that actually mattered to me. And so again, that sort of pushed me in a particular direction that led to grad school. Fantastic. Well, if there's any babysitters listening, that's the kind of influence you can have. Yeah, my my mom was very upset. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of having a big impact on somebody, she didn't like tell me I ought to read it. It was just sitting there on the coffee table. And I was curious. So can you remember the first piece of pro animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yeah. So again, um, it depends what you mean. But uh, as a graduate student, I wrote something that I presented at multiple conferences, but in the end didn't turn into a publication on suicide foods which is the phenomenon of uh, images on restaurants that serve meat of the animal that they serve looking happy and offering themselves to the observer as food or maybe offering their fellow conspecifics as food. Um, I think that those images are very disturbing. <laughs> you know, images of pigs happily cutting themselves or, you know, walking into an oven, you know, all these sort of jolly Warner Brothers cartoons-esque animals. Um, but also there's a, a large uh, sort of like weirdly sexual component to a lot of the images. Anyway, I wrote a paper um, arguing that that sort of showed an underlying um, subconscious guilt on the part of the eater who wanted to see that they that the animals were okay with this relationship too. Um, in the end, I didn't turn it into a publication. It's a, you know an early graduate paper because I couldn't sort of substantiate the the claim I was making about uh, subconscious motivations on part of the eaters. But um, hey, if anyone wants to take that up and write something about it, I would love to read it. The first thing that I published was an article called Domination and Consumption. And it looked at the tension in anarchist communities around veganism. So some anarchist uh, activists, scholars, just people who identify as anarchists, um, think that being vegan is uh, essential to being an anarchist because it is part of their larger project of non-hierarchy or, you know, being suspicious of unjustified hierarchies at any rate, um, so, you know, artificial separations saying that some things are allowed to exploit other things. Whereas other anarchists see being vegan as uh, sort of neutral to, or actually counter to being an anarchist because it uh, seems like a bourgeois sort of middle-class concern um, that it's not focused on actual, um, you know, human issues um, that it's often pursued in sort of a inside of the framework of our current economic and political institutions, you know, like buy more vegan food products, that kind of thing. And so I explore both of those positions in the paper, just try to understand both of them, and then uh, suggest a possible way that the two could be reconciled. I mean, leaning, I mean, ultimately, I say that probably they should be vegan, but uh, a way that that could be sort of justified and take on board some of the critiques uh, from the anti-vegan uh, side of that conversation, um, which, you know, it's kind of similar to my PLF paper, even though it's not around technology or farmers at all, in that I'm trying to look at the way that people are talking about a an issue, um, really trying to understand it, repeat it back to them in a way that they would accept, and then showing, you know, in an imminent critique kind of way that it's you know, should lead them to different conclusions than it does. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Well, I mean, there's a lot of sort of very common kinds of answers I could give. But to give a more interesting answer, and it's true as well, I would say Linda Kaloff. She's a, a sociologist uh, at Michigan State. When I started there as a PhD student in philosophy, I joined her animal studies specialization um, which she runs it's an interdisciplinary thing. Originally, it was just for sociologists, but she kindly let a couple of philosophers in. Um, 
her work uh, is quite interesting to me. It looks at the many ways that animals uh, have existed in relationship to our society, both actually, materially, like real non-human animals, um, but also as images, as totems, as, uh, you know, sort of a way of thinking, as metaphors, um, and how they are used as a tool for thought. And in so doing, we project a lot of false kind of assumptions on them. So she has a really interesting book on the representation of animal images throughout history. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, lions as the king of the jungle, which like no part of that sentence is true, <laughs> right? <laughs> they aren't they they aren't patriarchal. They aren't. There's no royalty. Uh, they don't live in jungles. You know, like there's lots of problems with that sentence. Um, you know, those sorts of images. What? How, how do they work as tools for thinking? And then how does that end up affecting the lives of the animals? You know, so lion hunting uh, being an example of that. What do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? Well, I mean, I think that academics wear a lot of different hats. So as researchers, um, I think it's important to work to integrate animals into all areas of research. So non-human animals are often, far too often, I think, ignored um, in various research sort of conversations. They are seen as an afterthought at best. Uh, you know, we think, we sort of think of humans as the only actors. And then there's this, you know, there are various constraints on us in the environment, including non-human animals as a constraint, like the weather. And I think that that's incorrect. And taking animals seriously in research uh, is important. And it's the thing that we can do in our own research and the thing that we can sort of call out when we see in other research that isn't doing it. And likewise, then, you know, talking about Linda's work, uh, when animals are used flippantly, <laughs> you know, when they are uh, when they're caricaturized for some sort of point you're making. I mean, someday when I have a lot of free time or a graduate student that I can exploit, I want to just find all of the times philosophy papers start with humans are the only animal who X and no evidence is ever given for that claim. There's no even point like there's no we never talk about non-human animals again ever in the paper. There's just some weird tick. I think we got it from Aristotle among a lot of philosophers. Uh, the best example, I was actually listening to something on the BBC a couple years ago, and a philosopher said, humans are the only animals that can understand a difference between the way the world is and the way the world ought to be. And I thought, have you ever, like, do you have a dog? Who's, have you ever seen any animal want to go outside or look at their bowl that is empty and then look at you and then look back at the bowl and then look at you? Presumably they understand a difference between the way the world is and the way they, were, they wish the world were. Um, and it'd be one thing to say, like, I've studied animals and I've learned that this is the case. That'd be shocking. I would be very surprised and want to read that literature. But they just feel like you can assert claims about non-human animals. Lots of academics do that, but I think philosophers are maybe the worst uh, offenders. So that's as researchers. But as teachers, of course, um, I think it's really valuable to open conversations and idea space, idea space for students to think about non-human animals, to think about alternative diets, uh, like I teach a philosophy of food class, and we discuss veganism and part of that, um, just to sort of open a space for them to think. And, you know, I don't think it's super productive to be very evangelical about things to students. But for lots of students, at least in my classes, you know, I'm down here in South Texas, the vast majority of my students are first generation university students. Um, often their parents don't have high school diplomas. And so there are certain kinds of conversations, um, you know, from a largely Mexican-American, uh, very meat-focused part of Mexico, in fact, as uh, right on the border with us. And so they've, they've not had these sorts of thoughts about animal interests, about animals having rights, about animals having their own lives independent of us, about uh, maybe being a vegan and not, or being vegetarian or something along those lines, um, is literally never occurred to them. And so opening those sorts of spaces for conversation, I think can be really productive. And then, um, you know, the sort of the other thing academics are, are university employees. And I think that as university employees, we ought to think very seriously, of, I mean, I should say, at best, <laughs> if we're lucky academics or university employees, um, then we ought to think about ways that animals are treated at our universities. Uh, quite a number of us work at places where animals are treated very badly and leaving it on the, leaving that burden of making that sort of point on the shoulders of our students who risk being suspended or expelled or uh, people in the community who risk being arrested for protesting or complaining about that, I think is doing a disservice. 
Yeah, thanks. There's a lot of interesting thoughts there. And you're touching upon a few kind of themes that we come back to again and again in animal studies scholarship. One of which is, of course, the relationship between academic work and uh, and activist work. And another of which is how much we've got to blame Aristotle for. <laughs> <laughs> so final quick question. Um, if you had the power to change one thing about the human non-human animal relationship, what would it be? Um, well, I mean, it's a hard question. I, uh, one, so I think that I'd like to say something like recognition justice. So this is a strain uh, of justice discussed in philosophy. I really suggest people go take a look at that. Uh, there's a lot of good literature on it. And then I've also written some literature, so go read the good stuff and then take a look <laughs> at mine. Um, but seeing seeing animals as beings with their own interests, their own lives, that they are not for us, right? But rather things that have uh, their own life, their own life plan, moment to moment, their own preferences, but also uh, just sort of their own existence and their own being. Um, I think that if we could recognize that in other animals, and by the way, part of that recognition is seeing that they have emotions that we often don't want to attribute to animals because the implications of attributing that would be uh, large. They have cognitive abilities that we likewise don't often want to attribute to those animals. Um, you know, Mark Beckoff has done a lot of good work on that. Uh, that doing this, that recognizing this, this, this other, uh, I think would lead to a less exploitative relationship. Uh, you know, I think that, frankly, we ought to do better at recognizing uh, the being and worthiness of other humans, too, for the same reason, that a less exploitative relationship um, and maybe moving towards something more equitable and just. So just before we round off, uh, what are you working on next? Um, well, a few things. Uh, most of me, I mean, in reference to PLF, I'm going to be actually presenting at a conference for the uh, Animal Welfare Research Network in the UK uh, in November. Um, and then I'm presenting at some other things connected to uh, the EU on PLF later. Um, and then also I have a, I have a podcast as well uh, called Thought About Food, where we're going to be talk, where we talk about um, various issues around food studies. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap when it comes to veganism or vegetarianism, but it's looking at food studies uh, very broadly. That's fantastic. Uh, so how can people find out more about your work and where can they find out more about the podcast as well? Yeah, so um, I have a website which is outdated and I need to update it. So if everyone like counts to 10, uh, <laughs> you know, wait a week and then uh, takes a look. Uh, I have a website, ianwerkheiser.wordpress.com. You can also follow me at Twitter, Ian Werkheiser. It's very nice that I have a unusual first name and last name combination. So I get to own all of my own names for everything. Um, and then if you're interested uh, in the podcast, Thought About Food, uh, if you just put that into Google with quotes around it, you should be able to find it. It's also, its website is thoughtaboutfood.podbean.com. And it has a Twitter uh, account, Food Thought Pod on Twitter. Great. Well, you've given us a lot to think about here, Ian. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. And if, you know, if any listeners want to reach out to me and send me an email, um, you know, ian.workheiser at utrgv for University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, uh, .edu, just feel free. I'm always happy to have conversations about these topics. Great. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, which is the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. You can also follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at a vegan philosopher. Also, don't forget to tell others about us and to review the podcast on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for others to find us. My name's Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com. Ah.